All right, welcome back, everybody. Uh, today, I'm very excited to have guest Chris Lethaby, uh, philosopher, uh, who's recently released uh, a book and some articles that I've very much enjoyed, and I'm very happy to have him speaking today. Uh, so, Chris, why don't you uh, go ahead, introduce yourself, who you are, what you do? Thanks, Winston. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Um, so I'm a lecturer in philosophy at the University of Western Australia in Perth. Um, I did my PhD in philosophy um, at the University of Adelaide in South Australia, finished that uh, a bit over five years ago, five and a half years ago. And now I've been here at UWA for a little over four years. I'm a philosopher of mind and cognitive science um, and neuroscience. These are my main areas of specialization. And my particular area of interest is philosophical issues related to psychedelics. So of all my um, academic publications to date, there is only one that does not have psychedelic in the title. And that's a, an anomalous uh, paper that I published as a, a master's student about 10 years ago. So one day I will put out another article or book that doesn't have psychedelic in the title. But I've been fairly preoccupied by this topic for um, around nine and a half years now well i can i can i can understand that it's a preoccupying topic uh it brings up a lot of a lot of a lot of questions uh and perhaps shed some light um in an interesting and, and novel way uh so as getting getting into the meat of the matter why why a philosophy of psychedelics the title of uh your your recent book uh what are the distinctively philosophical issues um of the psychedelic experience or its use in therapy or for, you know, uh, be becoming better than well, perhaps even. Yeah. So, I mean, there would be a justification for a philosophy of psychedelic experience or of psychedelic science or of any of these kinds of things that would not need to cite any particular properties of psychedelics, right? So one could, and some philosophers had have um, treated psychedelics as just another source of evidence for the philosophy of mind, right? So to understand how the mind functions in its normal or healthy state, we can look to unusual, abnormal pathological conditions. There's been a rich history of this in philosophy of mind, um, a tradition known as philosophical psychopathology in the last few decades. One could also look at uh, the recent use of psychedelics in psychiatry and in neuroscience as an object of interest for the philosophy of psychiatry and the philosophy of science, you know, asking how does psychedelic assisted therapy fit in with existing um, issues, philosophical issues that arise in psychiatric research and treatment, or how does psychedelic research, psychedelic neuroscience um, fit or otherwise with um, philosophical theories about scientific explanation and reduction and this kind of thing. But psychedelics themselves and the psychedelic experience have features that are more directly philosophical. So it's something that several people have noted over the years that um, in particular, Benny Shannon, the psychologist and philosopher who wrote a book on ayahuasca notes that um, people who have psychedelics very often start not only asking distinctively philosophical questions, but espousing recognizable philosophical positions, even when they have never had any training or education in philosophy or displayed any prior interest in these questions so there is it seems something about these experiences the experiences induced by psychedelics especially at high doses that really gets people asking fundamental questions or, or the experience seems to them to have implications for fundamental questions about the nature of knowledge um, the nature of existence the meaning of life and this kind of thing so it's an obvious um, application for philosophy to turn our attention to these experiences and the implications they seem to have and to try in a rational critical manner um, to address the question, do these experiences really have the implications people think they do? Um, and the particular set of issues that I've concentrated on the most, I mean, as I said, I'm a philosopher of mind and cognitive science by training, uh, but funnily enough, the set of issues I've concentrated on the most have been epistemological. So, you know, epistemology, the theory of knowledge, uh, and from a philosophical standpoint, I think one of the most striking things about psychedelic experience is how often people claim to gain some kind of knowledge from it. Um, and this is especially surprising if you're operating with the sort of conception of psychedelics that has been 
uh, dominant in Western culture for several decades now, this conception of them as hallucinogens or psychotomimetic. So when we hear about drugs like LSD or psilocybin in magic mushrooms, um, our central conception of what they do is that they make you see things that aren't there or they make you believe funny things. They take you out of touch with reality. Whereas people who um, take these drugs in moderate to high doses, especially in controlled conditions, clinical, therapeutic, religious settings, overwhelmingly have the opposite view, that the experience actually gets you more deeply in touch with reality, that it's a source of knowledge rather than delusion and error. And so, um, yeah, given not just the conception of psychedelics, but the conception of mind altering drugs in general that we have in Western society, the idea of gaining knowledge about the self about the world about the nature of reality from a drug-induced altered state of consciousness is very provocative so uh, that's one of the main reasons why uh, there is a need for a philosophy of psychedelics especially as more and more members of our society and perhaps ourselves uh, b believe that um, there there are real epistemic benefits that in some sense some of the insights in altered states of consciousness uh, induced by psychedelics or otherwise are in fact veridical. Um, and... Yeah, that's right. So, I mean, the idea that psychedelics are a source of genuine insight has been a relatively fringe countercultural view in mainstream Western society and global society. Of course, there are societies that, you know, have longstanding traditions of using psychedelics um, in religious contexts and spiritual medicinal contexts explicitly as sources of knowledge. But, um, you know, in, in the cultural context in which I work and operate, yeah, the um, idea of psychedelic experience as a source of knowledge has been been fringe and countercultural for a long time. And as you say, with the kind of psychedelic renaissance, um, the, the explosion of medical scientific public interest in these substances, the uh, proportion of people who hold this kind of view is growing. So yeah, I think it is a very good time for a, a critical evaluation of um, both of this view that psychedelics can be sources of insight and of the long-standing mainstream view that they are sources only of error and delusion, right? Both these views need to be subjected to a critical evaluation. Which you do quite uh, quite wonderfully in your book. Um, one, Thank you. You, you situate your whole project um, uh, within the book and within your other work, within kind of the philosophical program of, of naturalism, uh, uh, you, you make the distinction between methodological and uh, metaphysical naturalism. Um, and uh, in in the book, if I recall, you're, you're primarily committed to methodological naturalism, although I assume you're also metaphysically on that page as well. Yeah, yeah. So it's both, really. Um, and um, I mean, yeah, methodological naturalism at a first pass is just the idea that philosophy should be continuous with the sciences and and that the natural sciences in particular are our best guide to what reality is really like and to what really exists and so it's the denial of the idea that there could be such thing as a first philosophy as they call it you know a, a kind of philosophy that is prior to and independent of scientific knowledge and that could sort of sit in judgment on on the knowledge gained in the sciences i mean it doesn't mean that philosophy loses its critical edge but it means it takes its place as part of an overall multidisciplinary um effort to understand the world and what it's like and our place in it and uh the the you know one of the the fundamental constraints on every part of that uh, multidisciplinary enterprise is consistency with an adequacy in light of the empirical evidence gathered using rigorous um, experimental observational methods. So that's methodological naturalism, philosophy and the sciences integrated and, you know, where possible and where relevant philosophical conclusions and philosophical arguments not just consistent with, but um, ideally based upon and, and integrated with um, our best um, scientific evidence and theory. And then metaphysical naturalism, I, I think, is even more relevant, perhaps, to this whole project of understanding psychedelics. It's hard to define. So the slogan is the natural world is all there is which is not very informative unless you know what natural means. And so then we get all kinds of definitional questions. But um, a lot of people treat it as essentially equivalent to a generic sort of materialist or physicalist worldview. So the idea that everything that exists is wholly sort of physical or material in character. And in particular, um, because, of course, you can get thorny issues about defining material and physical as well. Um, this is philosophy for you, but you can define it uh, negatively as as, 
you know, the idea that mind or consciousness is not fundamental in reality, right? That whatever the foundational stuff of reality is, it's going to turn out to be non-minded, non-mental, non-conscious, and that uh, the mental, the conscious, the experiential is a latecomer um, on the evolutionary scene. It's something that develops ultimately out of the complex arrangements of non-conscious, non-minded stuff. I think that's the sort of idea that, you know, even if it's hard to define in positive terms what it is for something to be material or to be physical, that's the sort of view that most people who call themselves materialist or physicalist are expressing, I think. And that's that's basically what I mean by metaphysical naturalism. So no disembodied minds, you know, no transcendent minds, no universal minds, no cosmic consciousness, no spirit world, no God, no gods, uh, this kind of thing. Yeah which is an interesting stance to take with regard to the psychedelic experience, because for many people who take these substances in controlled or uncontrolled settings, what they often come out with are experiences as though, although they believe them to be vertical experiences of a cosmic, all-embracing kind of idealist uh, world picture um, that they believe to have, you know, directly experienced, directly apprehended. Um, yeah. And uh, in the context of a therapeutic setting, sometimes that seems to be a mediator of therapeutic benefits. So maybe you could say something uh, about what you call the metaphysical hallucination uh, account or theory. I, for I forget the exact phrasing uh, and yeah, the comforting, yeah, the comforting yeah. delusion objection. Um, sure. Yeah, yeah. So this is the, the linchpin of the whole book is the comforting delusion objection. Both of these wonderful phrases, comforting delusion, which is actually a phrase that gets me into trouble sometimes because it's a bit rude to people who believe these things. Um, but comforting delusion and metaphysical hallucination, I think they're both great phrases and I can't take credit for either of them. Comforting delusion comes from Michael Pollan, um, not in his famous 2018 book but actually in an article he published in the new yorker back in 2015 called the trip treatment um it has about 60 or 70 citations on google scholar which i think is pretty remarkable for a, an article in the new yorker and then metaphysical hallucination comes from the philosophers um, owen flanagan and george graham um but the comforting delusion objection is, yeah, the central concern uh, about psychedelic therapy that I'm attempting to respond to in the book. And so the facts that prompt the comforting delusion objection are basically these. Um, evidence gathered uh, in clinical trials over the last 30 years or so shows pretty convincingly that classic psychedelics, so serotonin 2A agonist psychedelics like LSD, psilocybin, DMT and mescaline can be given safely in controlled conditions um, when due care is taken both to healthy volunteers and to people with various psychiatric conditions and that when um, these drugs are given in moderate to high doses uh, to people with various forms of anxiety, depression, addiction, usually in conjunction with some form of psychotherapy, uh, the result is typically a substantial, a large reduction in symptoms that lasts anywhere from weeks to several months to even years after sort of one to three experiences. So this is this model of psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, you know, one to three moderate or high doses of a psychedelic um, under supervision in controlled conditions and usually um, combined with some form of psychotherapy. And it's regarded by many people as, you know, a very, very promising uh, new sort of potential breakthrough in psychiatric treatment. Uh, and it's very different to anything else we have in psychiatry, right? I mean, this sort of approach was tried before. Psychedelic assisted psychotherapy in this sense goes back to the 1950s and 60s. But in terms of recent um, standard psychiatric treatment, we're accustomed to thinking about basically talk therapy, you know, whether it's cognitive behavioral therapy or psychoanalysis or whatever, or on the other hand, um, drugs that are similar to um, SSRIs or MAOIs, you know, classical antidepressants where you take a pill every day and it doesn't induce an altered state of consciousness, but ideally after a while, uh, the symptoms of the illness start to lift and you start to feel better. Well, this is different because you're taking people and plunging them into a radically altered state of consciousness and the evidence suggests that, you know, as long as you've got the preparation and everything in place, um, immediately after that altered state of consciousness it's sort of a one or two or three shot affair but very often after a single experience the symptoms decrease dramatically so it's very different to what we're accustomed to and this raises all sorts of questions um, not least of which is how does it work you know how on earth can you have a discrete 
single day i mean it's, it's a bit misleading but it's not totally misleading to characterize it as a you know one day one shot intervention that brings about these dramatic and lasting reductions in psychiatric symptoms and so when we look for evidence when we look for clues about how this might work we find that in all the psychedelic research from the last 20 30 years one of the most consistent findings is that the people who benefit the most the people who get the largest and the most durable reductions in symptoms are people who have a specific type of psychedelic experience and this is the so-called mystical type experience so the point to emphasize here which you know those who are familiar with this area will know is that the effects of psychedelics are really variable so you can give the same dose to you know 10 20 30 different people and no two of them will have exactly the same experience and in fact some of them will have radically different experiences so you get a lot more variability than you do with other psychoactive drugs the um nature and the content of the experience is heavily influenced by the person's state of mind the environment they're in and these kinds of things um, but what you find is that in conducive conditions uh, at sort of moderate to high doses around maybe anywhere from a third to two thirds of people when you give them questionnaires to fill out afterwards satisfy the psychometric definition of a so-called complete mystical type experience and so this is uh, a construct that's been developed in psychology of religion based on the work of psychologists and philosophers like William James and Walter Stace and it's this type of experience that's defined um, in terms of these core features you know a sense of unity transcendence of individual selfhood um, transcendence of time and space uh, importantly a noetic quality a sense of gaining direct um, undeniable knowledge of reality um, profound positive mood a sense of sacredness these kinds of things and so James and Stace had the idea that this core type of experience is reported by you know contemplatives religious practitioners as well as just you know ordinary people uh, across times and places and cultures and while interpretations might differ the fundamental core the experiential core is the same it is this same type of experience and so these scales have been developed to to quantify and to operationalize this type of experience and it turns out to be a really strong predictor of good outcomes in psychedelic therapy the extent to which someone has or doesn't have this complete mystical type experience so if you're a naturalist a metaphysical naturalist like me like michael pollan you look at this kind of broad brush picture and it looks a bit worrying and you might be inclined to ask exactly what pollan asked in that uh, new yorker article is psychedelic therapy simply foisting a comforting delusion on the sick and dying? So the worry is basically that, you know, if you think, and I do, and Pollen does, that, you know, we've got good arguments and good evidence for believing um, a materialist or naturalist worldview, then um, on the face of it, it looks like this new breakthrough uh, in psychiatric treatment works precisely by inducing what Flanagan and Graham call metaphysical hallucinations, right? So, okay, low-dose LSD might give you visual hallucinations. You might see the walls melting and maybe you see, you know, faces in the carpet or whatever. You see things that aren't there. Flanagan and Graham say at high doses, LSD and psilocybin give you metaphysical hallucinations. You have experiences as of the ultimate nature of reality being something that really it isn't, um, namely being made of some kind of unified, boundaryless, um, sacred, uh, timeless, spaceless cosmic consciousness. Um, and it looks like that sort of experience is what predicts good outcomes. So the obvious kind of picture is, well, uh, especially when you consider that the best studied use therapeutic use of psychedelics is in palliative care is in the treatment of anxiety depression existential distress in people diagnosed with a terminal illness the obvious story is well you give people the drugs they have the metaphysical hallucination it's so powerful it's so overwhelming it's so compelling that they believe it they come away with this extremely comforting picture you know alan watts called it a joyous cosmology this picture of the universe that you get from psychedelic induced mystical experiences and then having this conviction you know it's not just like a religious belief that someone might get through kind of intellectual reasoning or through uh, indoctrination or upbringing or whatever it's got this backing of this profound experiential conviction you know people don't just believe it they've seen it they've experienced it for themselves and so it has this 
incredibly uplifting. This is the story, right? This is the kind of uh, prima facie picture, uh, believing in this joyous cosmology on the basis of apparently direct, um, authentic, uh, first-hand experience has this profoundly uplifting, beneficial restructuring effect on the person's psychology. And that, uh, you know, the adoption of this uh, non-naturalistic, uh, non-materialist metaphysical belief is the main active ingredient in the therapy. And so then you have um, a few questions that arise philosophically. So one is, is this really what's happening? You know, as an empirical matter, um, is it true that psychedelics make people believe in cosmic consciousness or God or whatever it is, and that that is the main agent of change because that phrase of pollen's comforting delusion right so he doesn't mean the word delusion in a clinical sense but delusion i think there just means false belief so it's the idea that it is a false belief but a comforting false belief so that also incorporates the idea that it's the non-naturalistic metaphysical belief that is the main um, driver of therapeutic gains so there are two questions does it really induce these beliefs and if it does, are they the main thing doing the therapeutic work? Um, and then there's uh, an ethical question that comes along for the ride as well, which is, well, does it really matter that much? You know, is it such a bad thing? Is it a terrible thing or is it a slightly bad thing or is it not a bad thing at all to be um, alleviating people's suffering by inducing um, unshakable false beliefs and metaphysical hallucinations? And importantly, you want to deny uh, both that that kind of joyous cosmology uh, picture is correct, but also that that's not what is actually uh, doing the legwork in the uh, the experiences, both the therapeutic benefits and then at, in many cases uh, in the actual phenomenology of people um, that, you know, not everyone has a psychedelic experience and comes away with uh, a belief in a joyous cosmology, or even if they do have such experiences, they may not assent to it and still gain the, psycho uh, the psychological and behavioral benefits um, mediated through instead uh, a, this kind of complete mystical type experience, which may or may not come along with these uh, metaphysical uh, beliefs, which are uh, importantly false from a naturalistic uh, perspective. That's right. Yeah. So it all gets a bit complex because there are a few apparent implications that I want to deny. Right. So ordinarily, we would assume that um, if a person has an experience as of a cosmic consciousness or divine reality under psychedelics, then they come away believing it because these experiences are reputed to be so powerful and so overwhelmingly convincing. Evidence suggests that's not the case, right? Um, some people do, but some people take a more agnostic or critical attitude. We might assume that if a person does have such a conversion, does have such a belief change, then that's the main thing um, that's responsible for any psychological benefits they might enjoy. I want to deny that too, right? I think when those belief changes occur, they can have some beneficial psychological effects. They can contribute to the therapeutic process, but I don't think they're the main thing driving it. And crucially, and this is one of the things that you need to dig a bit into uh, the psychedelic clinical research to really appreciate, we might assume that if someone has ticked the psychometric boxes for a complete mystical type experience, then they had a metaphysical hallucination in Flanagan and Graham's terms. In other words, they had an experience as of some kind of immaterial or non-natural reality. But if you look uh, more closely, in particular, at the qualitative interview studies with people who have actually undergone this treatment, you find people who are scoring above the cutoff in terms of the psychometric questionnaires for a complete mystical type experience. But it doesn't seem as though they've actually had any experience with apparent um, non-naturalistic metaphysical implications. Um, and this just gets to the fact that, among other things, the items, I mean, first off, the definition of a complete mystical type experience is 60% uh, or more on all seven subscales. And I mean, 60%, it's not that high, really. Um, uh, but also, uh, people vary. I mean, the items are very interpretable, right? These experiences 
first off are widely held to be ineffable so there's a real challenge for anyone coming out of an experience like this and trying to determine whether a particular string of words describes it accurately or not and then the particular things that that uh, these sentences are describing like you know awareness of ultimate reality feeling that i experienced something profoundly sacred and holy they are very very interpretable and um you know the fact that this construct does so much good work in psychedelic science i think suggests that the construct because i don't want to i don't want to be down on the construct of a complete mystical type experience here i think um, the evidence suggests that it is actually latching onto something psychologically real but i think it casts a broader net than the idea of mystical experience that people like william james and walter stace were operating with right i think um, it's not the case that um, every experience that is classed as a complete mystical type experience by these psychometric um, methods would be something that James or Stace would have identified as a full-blown mystical experience. And so that is the, the crucial point, I think, to grasp, because otherwise it's puzzling. You, you know, I have this perspective, the perspective that I, I try and go for, my positive story about how psychedelic therapy works, which... Um, no doubt we'll talk about more is that it's all about um changing the sense of self um i mean i have two friends who have been watching michael pollan's documentary on netflix and they're three episodes in they've got one episode to go and um one of them said to me yesterday they commented that um a lot of the broader themes in each of the three episodes they've watched so far tend to be the same that, that you know it's all about changing how you see yourself and I went, oh, yeah, that's what I sort of spent 100,000 words trying to say, you know, and that's and I sort of, uh, you know, I plagiarized Pollen a bit there, too, because that's a point he brings out very strongly in his book that um, all the different factors in psychedelic therapy that seem to be linked to good outcomes, they all somehow come back to the sense of self. You know, you look at things like mystical experience and insight emotional breakthrough feelings of awe they all have some interesting connection to the sense of self so yeah i was a bit inspired by pollen and then in in the book in a sort of philosophical and cognitive neuroscientific context i try and defend the hypothesis that this is the main mechanism this is what's really doing most of the therapeutic work but then that is puzzling in light of this correlation between ratings of complete mystical type experience and good therapeutic outcomes you know how can it not be um, changes in metaphysical beliefs that are doing most of the work and as i say i think the key to understanding that is realizing that this um, operational construct of a complete mystical type experience is not equivalent to non-naturalistic metaphysical hallucination you get lots of experiences that satisfy the criteria for the former but that don't really have substantial content to do with a spirit world or a cosmic consciousness or anything like that so what you what do you want to say is that one can have a complete mystical type experience psychedelically or otherwise mediated in which the self partially or completely uh, unbinds and that in some sense this is epistemically uh relevant it's it's not it's not a uh, delusion um and by by rendering you know we, you talk a little bit about uh you know self-modeling um that un unbinding those phenomenal models of the self and the environment and the boundaries between those things has uh important um epistemic as well as therapeutic psychological uh effects and so maybe you could riff off of that yeah yeah sure because there's more work, work to do of course to get to that conclusion so i mean having shown that you know if i have having shown that it's not all about non-naturalistic metaphysical beliefs that just sort of heads off one worry that naturalists might have about the epistemic status of this whole process but it's a, a different matter to say look not only does it not pose this particular type of epistemic risk that we might have thought it does but it also has genuine epistemic benefits you know it confers real forms of knowledge and real insights even if one um, is persuaded of a, a, a naturalist or a materialist worldview and so yeah that is something I try and do um, in the later part of the book in the middle to late chapters and um, yeah as you say it is based on this this, this theory of uh, the mechanisms of psychedelic therapy. It's based on earlier work I did in collaboration with uh, 
Philip Gerens, a philosopher, a mentor of mine at the University of Adelaide. And so um, the original idea there was Philip's, actually, that um, the concept of binding could be useful because he saw a connection between this work in psychology, uh, suggesting that a central function of self-representation. So these psychologists, Swee and Humphreys, were interested in this question. Uh, what use is it for humans to have a representation of the self, you know? Uh, it's pretty widely accepted in philosophy and psychology and neuroscience that one of the things the brain does, as well as building models or representations of the external world and the body, um, is it also builds models or representations of the self. And there's a few different possible answers to this, but this is the question that Swee and Humphreys were interested in, is what is the function of um, the human self-model or self-representation? What does it do? And um, their story, in brief, is that one of its main functions is to integrate information. So they use this concept of cognitive binding, um, which has been around for a while in cognitive science and neuroscience. And it's basically the idea of integrating representational parts into coherent representational wholes. So when we see a visual object, we've got different features like the color, the shape, the motion, the location being processed in different areas of the visual cortex, presumably using different algorithms. And yet somehow in experience, they all come together as this unified object. We experience all the properties as belonging to a single um, substantial underlying thing that persists through time and that can persist despite changes in its properties and so um, the question is well how does this happen and this is what the idea of binding is it's you know there are different theories about how it's actually done but it's just whatever process integrates uh, these separate representations into a coherent larger complex representation and so Swee and Humphreys applied this idea um, to self-modeling basically um, working on the basis of a whole lot of evidence that information integration is enhanced when self-reference is involved right so information that is relevant to the self tends to be integrated or bound preferentially um, relative to information that is not related to the self um, and this is across all sorts of different tasks different sensory modalities and so on so they synthesize this large body of evidence and come up with this concept of self-binding and they say you know even though we have this diversity of ways of modeling the self that many theorists have noted we've got the the narrative self, the bodily self, the social self, blah, blah, blah. They say, nonetheless, there is this core self-representation, um, a key function of which is to sort of serve as an integrative hub for self-relevant information across different time scales, modalities, tasks, levels of processing, whatever. And so um, Philip's idea was to say, well, you know, we can combine this with insights from the predictive processing or predictive coding theory of brain function to get some purchase on um, what it is that psychedelics do to the self and how psychedelics bring about these experiences of um, ego dissolution or um, ego death or whatever. And so, yeah, we built up this, this uh, theory, basically taking the concept of self-binding from Swee and Humphreys and then looking at the predictive processing theory of brain function, which is this very exciting, very influential theory at the moment that kind of says the brain is a prediction machine and the whole modus operandi of the brain is to build these complex hierarchical models of the world and use them in a top-down fashion to generate predictions or best guesses of the incoming sensory input. And the idea is that any input that is predicted successfully just gets cancelled out. You know, it's um, not news. It does The signal doesn't need to travel any further up. And it's only the prediction errors, the unpredicted inputs that kind of keep travelling up through the, uh, the process hierarchy and need to attract further attention and maybe the model needs to be updated or maybe we can ignore this particular error because the conditions are noisy or uncertain or whatever um, and so basically our thought was that uh, this picture of brain function provides a very nice um, explanation of how this process of self-binding might work right so how is it that the brain integrates all this information about me, you know, information coming from interoception about the internal condition of my body, um, visual information when I can see my body from the outside, um, social information, emotional information, um, memories of things last week, 10 years ago, whatever. How does the brain attribute all of these things to this single underlying thing that we experience called me? Um, and 
there is a predictive processing account of how cognitive binding in general works, this integration of representational parts into representational wholes, which is that it's basically just a, a function of this top-down form of processing. You know, you have these uh, going through a fair bit of, you know, complex stuff fairly quickly here, but you have these hierarchically structured models and uh, the further up you go, the more and more abstract you get, right? So lower levels of the system might be modeling some fairly concrete properties like, um, you know, color and shape and things like that. And then as you get further up, uh, the models are dealing with increasingly sort of abstract things over larger spatio-temporal scales, such as, for instance, objects that persist through time you know and so you've got um the seagull you've got your perception of its kind of parts its wings its beak its head its colors its shape its position but all these properties change you know it kind of it, it moves um it goes from place to place it changes its position whatever and yet you still have the experience um as of a single object a single entity that underlies all the properties and persists through their changes and the idea the predictive processing story about binding that um, the philosopher Jakob Hovey is responsible for is that uh, this is basically done by these higher level models that kind of represent the idea that there is a single thing called the seagull and then use that as a strategy to predict what you're going to see at lower levels you know that you're going to um, see the color and the shape and so on in this position next and that it's likely to behave in these sorts of ways and not others it's going to come and steal your chips right is a, a, a hazard that we here in australia are very familiar with um yeah so and and so our idea was well you can apply the same um thinking to the self right it's a, a much higher level more abstract more pervasive thing but all of this kind of perceptual information emotional information conceptual narrative autobiographical information uh, relevant to the self is all integrated or bound together by this high level model that the brain creates of this single simple underlying persistent entity called me um, and so a lot of the ideas here are you know uh, from buddhism via thomas metzinger so there, there's nothing terribly original um, but yeah we're sort of situating it in the context of this idea of self-binding and predictive processing theory and then using that as a framework um, and then the idea is well what psychedelics do one way or another is they seem to disrupt the coherent functioning of the neural systems that have been linked to self-representation. So a large body of evidence points to, in particular, these two uh, systems, the default mode network and the salience network as being involved in different aspects of self-modeling or self-representation. Um, and psychedelics seem consistently to alter the functioning of those networks, you know, maybe to decrease the activity of their constituent regions or to decrease their coherence, uh, the, um, their uh, distinctness from other networks. And so our story then is that what this does is, among other things, it disrupts this process of self-binding, the process whereby the brain integrates you know of all the information it's processing of all the stimuli of all the representations it picks some of them but not others um, and integrates those ones and says these all belong to this thing called me and in so doing it also draws a line it draws a boundary around those and said well the other things that aren't part of this model are not me they don't belong to this um, unitary underlying entity and so that process of binding which is simultaneously one of integration and segregation you know bringing all the selfie things under the banner of one entity and then shutting everything out of that camp that gets disrupted to one extent or another and the thought is that disruption to that process of self-binding can explain many of the uh, different effects of psychedelics you know more and less dramatic uh, you know bodily effects narrative effects um, therapeutic effects metaphysical effects lots of them could be explained in terms of a disruption to this basic process of self-binding and that disruption to that basic process of, of self-binding, that distinction from of the bare, very basic phenomenological distinction of subject and object, of me and not me, of my body and the environment. Um, as uh, many people who have undergone the psychedelic experience know that that uh, that blurs or dissolves, you know, drug-induced ego dissolution. The dissolution is quite literal. <laughs> That's um, right, yeah. Uh, and, but importantly, you know, th this could all just be a curiosity. So, you know, you're, uh, the re representations of, of the self in, 
psychedelic experience or meditation. So they get disrupted. So they get dissolved. And then, and then, so, so what? Um, it's the, so what being that there are, there seem to be, um, you know, more and more studies coming out, immense therapeutic, uh, benefits and perhaps, and moral benefits even, um, to this right. undergoing this yeah. experience. There, there are philosophical, um, ethical, um, and behavioral ramifications of undergoing these experiences. Yeah, and epistemic ramifications, which is exactly. what you were originally asked. And so that's that's what we need to come to is, yeah, how does this process... So, I mean, you know, we could see how this process of unbinding the self could lead to something like mystical experiences in the classical sense. You know, the cardinal feature of them is the sense of unity. And so if you radically disrupt the process that kind of models the self as an entity distinct from the rest of the world, it's not just hard to see how you could get this phenomenology of uh, boundarylessness, you know, of boundless, um, timeless, spaceless, unity of consciousness. Um, and so that gives you some idea of how it might lead to the things that I as a naturalist want to call epistemic risks or epistemic harms how then does it lead to things that I consider epistemic benefits well there's a few different ways but one is just that through undergoing this process you can become very alive to the nature of ordinary experience right and the fact that this is all um, in some sense, a construction. It is some kind of model being generated by the mind or the brain. We are not directly in touch with um, things in themselves, with the objective external world. Now, my philosophical position is very akin to what used to be called indirect realism. So the idea that there is a mind independent objective world out there, but that in our conscious experiences, in our perceptual experiences in particular, we are not in direct contact with that world. Rather, we are in contact with inner representations of that world. And um, this is a sort of view that is fairly unfashionable in philosophy these days. And I think it would come back into fashion if more philosophers took psychedelics, uh, because I think this is one of these things, one of the things that this experience can do is it can it can increase this property uh, known as phenomenal opacity, um, which is, uh, yeah, it's sometimes strange to people that that's the word we use for it because opacity seems like darkness, whereas uh, phenomenal opacity is actually becoming aware of something. So the most obvious example of phenomenal opacity or the easiest one to understand is when you start having a lucid dream, right? So you're having an ordinary dream. You don't know you're dreaming. Suddenly you realize you're dreaming. And by definition, that's when you begin having a lucid dream. And that is what phenomenal opacity is. It's realizing that all these things around me uh, that I had taken for tables and chairs and trees and so on are actually mental representations of tables and chairs and trees and so on. And that conclusion in itself is neutral on whether there are real tables and chairs and trees outside the mind that correspond to them. You know, my view is that in sober waking life, most of the time there are, in lucid dreams there aren't. But nonetheless, the point is that what you have been taking for external things themselves um, are in fact these internal um, simulations. And so here I'm uh, in good company, I think, with philosophers like Thomas Metzinger and neuroscientists like Antti Ravonsuo. So they both share this idea that, and they're both uh, naturalist, materialist thinkers, but they both have this idea that conscious experience is something like, um, well, the phrase that is associated a lot with predictive processing and with the neuroscientist Anil Seth these days is a controlled hallucination. You know, our experience of the world is no different in kind from a hallucination in the sense that it is this totally internal sort of world simulation or world model it's just that in the case of veridical waking perception the content of the hallucination is governed or controlled or shaped by actual input coming in from a real objective external world and so um Rivonsuo uses the metaphor is it even a metaphor i'm not sure that it is of virtual reality you know he thinks virtual reality is a great way to think about what the brain is doing in generating conscious experience um and he says wonderfully that our brains give us a realistic and convincing out of brain experience so they give us uh, the experience as of being a body uh, located in and directly experiencing an objective external world 
but you know most of the time unbeknownst to us the entire experiential field is something entirely within the brain it is a process of simulation virtual reality world modeling happening within the brain itself and the thought is that psychedelic experience even if it doesn't give you every aspect of this picture it can give you that very dramatic profound direct awareness that the things you have been taking for pre-given unproblematic external objects are mental representations are mental constructions and this extends beyond tables chairs and trees to me to i and so that is uh, you know for anyone who has any any kind of familiarity with buddhism and meditation it's an obvious idea that having that sort of insight experientially can be of profound importance now in many schools of buddhism the idea is that the ultimate insight the most important insight that you need to get experientially is something like there is no self or the self does not exist and of course exactly how we're supposed to understand this is debated a lot but um i don't think that is actually what most people are getting out of psychedelic experience for what it's worth um you know sometimes buddhistically inclined people want to read it that way i know i've been tempted to do that in the past right um yeah, but I think if you if you have a look at the sorts of things people say, it's very rare that anyone who hasn't actually come into the psychedelic experience with some Buddhist baggage comes out of it saying something like the self doesn't exist or the I doesn't exist. But I think uh, what people do realize is that the sense of self is this profoundly constructed thing, you know, that the stories we tell about ourselves are not who we are. In fact, very often in these reports, you get these people spontaneously making this distinction between um, what they call I and me. And I've seen at least two of them using those same terms. Um, and I think um, James might have made a similar distinction. Um, but, you know, they define it in the same way. They say me, me is like the self-concept. Me is all the structures and roles and responsibilities and things like that. Whereas I is the pure experiential subject prior to any kind of content or, or concepts or anything like that. And you get people describing this profoundly liberating experience of being I in the absence of me and having this realization that all the me stuff is not who I am and that I am separate from it. I can survive without it. It's all in some sense optional. Uh, and so these are the kinds of things. And I think you also get, uh, you know, the question of veridicality becomes a bit more complex. But of course, people very often report psychological insights as well, autobiographical insights, sort of um, recovered memories and insights into their relationships and into the causes of their mental health problems or their life problems or whatever. And I think, yeah, it is, there is some hard work to be done in figuring out how often these sorts of things are veridical but i think very often they are so you get these general kinds of insights you know direct experiential acquaintance you know i, I put it in terms of the philosophical concept of knowledge by acquaintance with things like um, the constructed nature of the sense of self and also just the uh, the vast potential of the mind you know people have this experience of my god i didn't know i could feel like this I didn't know it was possible to see the world in this way or experience beauty in this way or to feel, you know, these emo this, this degree or this intensity of kind of love or wonder or awe or whatever. Um, so these kinds of, you know, general insights into the nature of the self and the nature of experience and the potential of experience and then more specific insights into um uh particularities of one's own life and one's own psychology and so on these are some of the kinds of things that i think this self-unbinding process can promote which are totally you know naturally naturalistically acceptable um, epistemic benefits absolutely um and we're we're coming up on i think uh time but perhaps before we we close it off oh, um so we, we yeah time goes goes by like that um <laughs> Perhaps before before we close it out, um, we could kind of situate this whole conversation within a uh, naturalized conception of spirituality. You know, in the absence of uh, of non naturalistic metaphysics, what could a viable, um, vital, you know, enlivening and uh, enlightening spirituality? What would what would that look like? Um, and what role does this self unbinding through psychedelics or or meditation and in in a, in a article um, you you actually uh, compare these two? Uh, modalities of uh, alteration of experience how how does that all fit together in your view 
Yeah. So, I mean, the idea of spirituality is really interesting um, because traditionally it is something that might be associated with non-naturalistic metaphysics. You know, we think that to be spiritual is to believe in spirits or to believe in, in some spiritual realm. But there is this way that the term has come to be used, which is sort of exemplified in the phrase spiritual but not religious, right? And so when people describe themselves as spiritual but not religious, one thing that they're sometimes saying is that they've got no truck with organized religion, right? They don't like the structures and, and kind of, uh, you know, rituals and whatever of organized religion. But it tends to have this other connotation as well of being pro-experiential and anti-dogmatic so the idea that one approaches matters of sort of ultimate meaning and purpose in a way that is not about uh believing you know uh, accepting metaphysical beliefs on faith or in some sort of doctrinaire fashion but rather about pursuing some kind of experiential knowledge or, or self-transformation or something like that so there is this kind of different concept afloat nowadays this different understanding of spirituality and you can approach this in a conceptual way right and i don't think you necessarily have to but i think it's an interesting exercise you know philosophers get very interested in defining concepts and figuring out what concepts mean and when it comes to a term like spirituality there's not going to be a single concept it's going to correspond to several different ones um and there are different ways of trying to approach giving a, a you know an analysis of a concept but something that i find very striking is that people reach for spiritual as the best word to describe psychedelic experiences very often and that this cuts across metaphysical content it cuts across beliefs you know so people who experienced a cosmic consciousness or a divine reality or a spirit world will obviously call the experience spiritual but then people who had none of that content but who instead experienced you know this kind of more naturalistic uh you know dissolution or kind of loosening of the sense of self and this feeling of profound interconnectedness wonder and awe appreciation of nature uh, things like this they will also reach for the word spiritual and so this suggests to me that there might be some common factor right there might be something unifying both the naturalistic and the non-naturalistic types of psychedelic experience that is at the core of at least one concept of spirituality one concept that is being referred to nowadays by that word and i think if you look and do a bit of analytical work the most plausible idea is that it is this disruption to the sense of self that when you get profound disruption to self-binding processes and so i borrow um from the philosopher iris murdoch the term unselfing um she had an interest in zen and she kind of has a famous passage where she describes these experiences of sort of suddenly being taken out of yourself by by the beauty of nature and you know cleansing your mind of selfish care and worry by this rapt attention and absorption in it's a kestrel in her example you know a hovering kestrel outside the window um so yeah i think this idea of unselfing and um yuso kahonen is a, a finnish philosopher who wrote a, a master's thesis on psychedelic experiences and moral enhancement a philosophical account of um, moral perception in fact in the psychedelic experience and he also uses murdoch's concept of unselfing as a a way for thinking about this a unifying concept but um yeah i think that uh, seems to be the common element and if you look at some recent attempts by philosophers and others to characterize a naturalistic spirituality in fact in fact a philosopher jerome stone surveyed about a dozen of these accounts and looked for common themes and he said well what they all seem to be about is that first off it's about um connection i'm trying to remember he said had three things it's connection aspiration and asking the big questions so spirituality is about feeling connected to other people to your body to your senses to the natural world um it's about aspiration you know aspiring to realize our, our values and embody um you know our highest deepest um principles and this kind of thing and it's about asking the big questions asking you know why is there something rather than nothing and what happened before the big bang and these kinds of things you know characteristically mind-bending trippy philosophical questions and um and he says that what all these three have in common is that they're all ways of breaking through the narrow walls of the ego you know so connection is all about 
feel you know having the boundaries of the ego or the self become more porous aspiration is all about going beyond the kind of inclination to just follow the the selfish whims of the ego and trying to realize and embody some higher values um, and asking the big questions similarly is about kind of broadening attention beyond the everyday preoccupation with you know getting through the day and um, you know um, getting paid and achieving the goals of the self to actually contemplate things that are useless um, uh, and that don't really have any practical value that you know the contemplation of which doesn't directly serve any of the sort of uh, mercenary goals and interests of the self so and I think that picture maps onto psychedelic induced unselfing and self unbinding really neatly you know these are all just textbook phenomena that people describe in psychedelic sessions and of course there is huge overlap with uh, meditation as well you know people who practice buddhists and other forms of meditation and again whether people are practicing uh, buddhist meditation in more traditional religious contexts or in more modernized secular contexts where where uh, uh, whether people's psychedelic experiences have some kind of non-naturalistic metaphysical content or whether they don't this seems to me to be the core is this process of unselfing self-unbinding that leads to uh, these kind of characteristic symptoms of connection aspiration and asking the big questions so that's my kind of take on what a um, a naturalistic uh, psychedelically informed and meditatively informed naturalistic spirituality might be about Thank you. Thank you for the the overview. And, and thank you so much for taking the time to come on and talk about your, your wonderful work. Um, I really encourage everybody listening, go check out Chris's book, uh, Philosophy of Psychedelics. Um, and also, uh, I'm, I apologize, I'm forgetting the name of the, the article that was published in the recent anthology. Also excellent, oh, comparing yeah. psychedelic well, phenomenology and, and meditation and situating that within predictive processing. Um, check out check out both of those. Maybe, can, do you remember the title? <laughs> Well, the the book is the Rutledge Handbook of the Philosophy of Meditation, edited yep. by Rick Rapetti. So yeah, my chapter is in there on psychedelics and meditation, and there's a whole heap of other excellent chapters on philosophy and meditation as well. Yeah. Well, is there is there anything we didn't cover that you'd like to add in here at the end? So many things, but nothing specific <laughs> that springs to mind. <laughs> this this conversation. I mean, you you wrote a whole book. This this conversation could have gone on uh, for for hours. There's. Uh, so much to discuss, and I'm 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 glad people are, are are doing the work to make sense of of these these wacky and wild and wonderful experiences. Uh, Absolutely, and, yeah. Bring 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 it all together. So so thank you so much. Um, My pleasure. Thanks, Winston. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for listening. <laughs>